There you go. Welcome everyone to Ontology Summit 2020. Today is the 18th of March, 2020. And our speaker today is Spencer Briner from NIST. He's working in the Software and Systems Division of the Information Technology Lab. And his research has been focused on applications of category theory. And uh, today he's going to be talking about how you can use category theory techniques to enrich graphical representations. And the title, as you can see, is Composing Knowledge Graphs Inside and Out. Spencer? All right. Yep. Everybody can hear me? Yep. OK, great. Uh, yeah, so I'm uh, Spencer Briner. At the, as uh, Ken mentioned, I'm at the National Institute for Standards and Technology. Uh, he pretty much uh, said it all. OK, so uh, I guess I'll just go ahead and on to slide number two. Uh, so there's a little bit about me. Uh, as I said, I work at NIST uh, in the Information Technology Lab and the Software and Systems Division with uh, Ram Sriram, who I think many of you know. I received my PhD from Carnegie Mellon in 2013, where I studied category theory and applications of, of CT to logic. And my work at NIST is focused on a relatively new area called applied category theory, and specifically using categories to uh, model different aspects of systems. And in that work, uh, some of the things that we are looking at are knowledge representation, uh, knowledge integration, and the use of and the integration of different types of semantics that we might want to uh, analyze a problem with. And for today, uh, just a short outline. So I'll start with a little bit about the relationship between graphs and categories. And then I'll say why, from my perspective, graphs alone are just not enough to express the sorts of relationships that we're interested in. And so then I'll give uh, sort of a potential vision of how we might interpret knowledge graphs as being about categories and functors. And I'll give some examples of what that might look like in a specific uh, case that's coming from oper operations research and specifically a problem called open shop scheduling. Uh, so on to slide three. So I called this slide, uh, what's beneath a knowledge graph? And so uh, when, I, when, Ken asked, uh, when Ken and Ram asked me to do the, the talk today, I didn't really know what a knowledge graph was, so I started looking around. And after looking for a bit, I find that I'm still not entirely certain what a knowledge graph is. But I pulled out this quote from the Ontolog uh, introductory summary, and I, this is not presented there as a definition, but I think it's, it's as good a definition as I've found yet in, just, in that a knowledge graph is a structured representation of semantic knowledge that is stored as a graph. But for me, that raises as many questions as it answers. And in particular, I want to know what structure and how is it stored. And so today, I'll give you some answers that category theory might give to those questions. And so some themes that we'll see in the talk today are the use of small bite size ontologies instead of uh, large, uh, complicated structures. Uh, we'll look at the duality between data, uh, the data that sits on top of an ontology and the concepts that are expressed inside of it. And I'll also talk about how category theory allows us to internalize computation and proof into graphical structures. Uh, so on to slide four. So for me and for pretty much any category theorist, a graph is always going to be directed and optionally uh, multi in the sense that you can have more than one edge between two nodes. Uh, if you prefer undirected graphs, then you can always implement those inside of directed graphs by uh, adding an involution on the edges. That, that's an operation that turns them around and then turns them around again and returns to the identity. And if you don't like multi graphs, you just don't have to put extra edges in. So uh, for me, these are the most general type of graph that one could use. And if you're interested in more specific types of graphs, those can be implemented using these. And so when a category theorist talks about a graph, we're usually going to be representing them more specifically as a pair of sets. So n is going to be the set of nodes, and e is going to be the set of edges, along with a pair of functions, s and t, that map each edge to its source and target respectively. 
And so at the bottom of this slide, there's an illustration of what this looks like. So on the left-hand side, I've drawn a graph as we usually think of a graph. So it has five nodes, A, B, C, D, and E, and it has eight edges uh, that are all numbered. And then on the right-hand side of that image, I've shown the same structure depicted as a pair of sets and a pair of functions. And so up at the top of that, we see all eight of the edges, one through eight. At the bottom, we see all five of the nodes, A through E. And then the red and green arrows illustrate the two functions. So for example, if we look at edge number one, we can see the green source of that is A and the red target of that is B. And similarly for arrow four, it starts uh, on the green, we, we look at the source, which is the green pointer to A and the target is the red pointer to C. And so this is just to illustrate how we can take a directed graph and wrap it up into a structure that's defined in terms of sets and functions, which of course are gonna be the bread and butter of category theory. Uh, okay, so on to slide five. So a cat, a, a, I don't know how much uh, people in the audience know. Uh, I've got the, I've got the uh, chat log pulled up in front of me, but I'm, I'm gonna try and ignore it while I'm talking, and then I'll go back at the end and, and see if there are questions that need to be answered. Uh, but that said, if there is anything that is confusing, please feel free to stop me and ask questions as I'm going. Uh, okay, so on uh, Spencer, slide five. Spencer, yeah, go, go ahead. I can, can you just slow down a little bit? Yes, sure. I Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Okay, I, ha I have a tendency to do that a little bit. Okay, so on slide five, I'm going to introduce categories. I'm not sure how familiar uh, the people in the audience are, but I'm not gonna give any formal definitions. Uh, I'm gonna give some semi-formal definitions that are maybe a little bit different than what you might have seen in the past. So for me, at least today, a category is first of all a graph, G, together with, and now something that you don't often see in introductory presentations of category theory, but I think is a very important conceptual idea is that there's actually two different versions of what a category is. So the first version that I've listed is the one that's close to what you may have seen before. So it's a graph together with a partial associative operation that has identities. And so what does that mean? It says, if you give me two edges, and moreover, the target of the first edge is the same as the source of the, of the second edge, so that they match tip to tail, then I can compose them and build a new edge out of that. And so this is the sort of standard definition of category th categories that you would run into in an introductory textbook. And the examples that we tend to have in mind are what I like to call semantic categories. So the canonical one is the category of sets and functions. So there the nodes are sets. We're free to think about finite sets if we want. Uh, and the arrows and the edges are functions. Of course, this is something that many graph theorists typically wouldn't think about as a graph because first of all, it's infinite. Even if we limited ourselves to some, sub some finite subcollection of sets, there's still many, many edges between any pair of nodes. And so this is not something that looks like a graph in, as most people are used to thinking of it. But nonetheless, it does conform to the definition that I gave on the previous slide because we have a collection of edges, those are the functions, we have a collection of nodes, those are the sets, and for each one of those functions, we can point to the source set and the target set. So sets is the really the progenitor of pretty much all semantic categories, or at least most of them, uh, but there are plenty more. So graphs themselves form a semantic category in which the nodes are graphs, so there's a, a level shift going on that can be a little difficult to get used to, but an entire graph all by itself is a single node in the semantic category. And an arrow is a, is a graph homomorphism. So it sends edges to edges and nodes to nodes in a way that preserves the relationship between edges and nodes. Uh, there's also a semantic category of vector spaces. So uh, one way to present that is to have the objects or the nodes be the natural numbers and the arrows to be matrices, not necessarily square. And the composition there is matrix multiplication. And of course, we can't, make, we can't multiply any two matrices, only if their rows and columns have the, same, have the same numbers. And so that is exactly saying that the source of one matches the target of the other. 
And so one other semantic category that we'll be interested in in today's talk uh, is called type. And this is a category that one can construct out of a programming language, most often a uh, statically typed programming language, although one can do it in something like Python. And I'll say a little bit more about how this works uh, in a few slides. So that's the standard story of what a category is. But there's another version that's actually going to be more important for us today. So version two says that a category is a graph together with a concatenation stable equivalence relation over paths. So that's a bit of a mouthful. So the idea is uh, a path, first of all, a path in a graph, in a directed graph, is going to be a sequence of edges that match tip to tail in the way that I just mentioned before. And to say that an equivalence relation is concatenation stable means that if I have two paths that I regard as equivalent, and then I concatenate another path onto the end of that, then the resulting longer paths should also be equivalent. And so that just says that if I have two things that I regard as equal, and then I add some more stuff on, then the resulting paths that are longer should also be equal. And so uh, I, I'm going to typically refer to categories defined under this uh, approach as schemas. And so we've actually already seen one on the previous slide. So script G is the schema which has two nodes and two edges. So E and N with two arrows between them. And this is a, this is a perfectly good directed graph. And that is the schema that can be used to define the semantic category of all graphs, as we just saw on the previous slide. Uh, some other ones that we'll see in just a minute are uh, script P and script S, which are going to represent open shop scheduling problems and open shop scheduling solutions. Uh, okay, so before I go to the next slide, maybe I'll just pause and ask if there are any questions. Okay, on to slide six. Okay, so uh, the, the upshot really of the previous observation is that any graph already is a category where is is in quotation marks, but it, none, nonetheless, uh, I really do mean that any graph determines a unique category uh, in a unique way. And the structure that mediates the relationship between categories and graphs is called an adjunction, in particular, uh, a free and forgetful adjunction. So what that means is if I have a category, first of all, I can forget about either the composition operation or the equivalence relation and just keep, and just keep the graph that I started with and get a graph out of it. On the other hand, I can also go back in the other direction by taking a graph and regarding it as a category in which the equivalence relation is just actual equality. So two paths in a free, in a free category are equal just in case they literally are the same, the same path. So it's a, a bit of a mouthful, but the idea is if we're thinking of a, a category as a graph with an equivalence relation, that we can think of a graph as being a category in which that equivalence relation is trivial. And so the way that, a, that an adjunction works is it provides an equivalence between transformations in two different places. And so that's what's, uh, maybe I should, I should describe the picture that's shown in the center of this, uh, this slide. So on the left, we have a pair of categories, graph and cat, and a pair of functors, free going up and forget going down. And so that, those are the maps that transform graphs into categories and categories into graphs. Uh, but moreover, the, the adjunction says that these pair of functors satisfy a special property in that they allow us to translate uh, relationships between categories into relationships between graphs. So uh, that's what's on the second, on the right hand side of this picture. It says that if I have a functor in cat from a free category into C, then that's equivalent to just having a graph homomorphism from the original graph into the category where I have forgotten the operations. And so essentially what this is saying is that if I want, so what does a functor do? It needs to send objects to objects and arrows to arrows in a way that preserves composition. 
But because of the way that we built the arrows in the free category by just concatenating them, them together into paths, once I've told you where each of the individual edges go in, into this category C, then there, I have no choice about where to send the paths because I have to send the path to the composition of the images of the edges in that concatenated path. This is a little easier if I could draw a picture on the board, but uh, I, hope that, I hope that that was clear enough. The idea is if I have a path that has three edges in it, and I know the function that's associated with each, each of those edges, then I can get a function associated with the path by just comp composing those three functions. And so this gives us a way of translating between graph homomorphisms and functions. And of course, these arrows go, these functors go up and down, up to cat and then back down to graph. And so that means we have two round trips. One of them takes a graph to its free category and then forgets about the the composition, so uh, that's, a, that's a round trip that I'm calling path of G, and there's a, anytime you have an adjunction, you get a free structure called a monad that says that you can take the original graph you started with and embed that into the category, into the, uh, into the path graph. Alternatively, if you start with a category, you turn it into a graph, and then you build the free graph on that, then the arrows are paths of, of the arrows in factor of C are paths whose elements are arrows, and we can just use the composition in C to get a single arrow. And so that's why I've called the, the second comanator that goes from factor C into C, compute. And so the idea is basically that the round trips of this adjunction give us two operations that allow us to uh, express certain special relationships between a graph and the category that's built from it or a or a category and the graph that is forgotten from it not a great way of saying that but i i think that's that's okay this is probably a bit more technical than we really need anyway so i think we'll be okay uh, okay so on to the next slide slide seven okay so here is just a really tiny bite-sized example of what i have in mind when I'm talking about these categorical models. So uh, in open shop scheduling, this is a standard problem from operations research. Uh, we start with a set, of, uh, a set of jobs. So we need to do jobs in this case, one, two, three, and four. And we have a set of machines, in this case, saw, drill, lathe, and mill. And for each job and each machine, we have some amount of processing time that the, that, that job needs to be done. So for example, J1, needs to be processed for two hours on the saw, two hours on the drill, two hours on the lathe, and two hours on the mill. Uh, if we have a value of zero, that means no processing. So for example, job J3 needs to be done for two hours on the saw. It does not need to visit the drill at all, and then three hours on the lathe and one hour on the mill. Now, the way that I said that, it sounded like those, those different tasks needed to be done in order, but in an open shop scheduling problem, that's actually not the case. The, the various tasks can be done in whatever order we like. And so on the right-hand side, we have a schedule that solves this scheduling problem. And so uh, this is a, a fairly typical view of a schedule. It's oriented towards the machines rather than the jobs. So that's what's, that's what's shown on the left-hand side. And so the gray blocks are the tasks. And if you consult the so uh, for instance, if we look at the top row there, we, saw, we see that the saw is going to work on job J1 for two hours. Then it will have a break for one hour. It'll work on job J4 for one hour, another one hour break, then J2 for two hours, and job J3 for three hours. And so if you look carefully, you can see that the amount of time allocated to the task is the same as what's given in the problem on the left. Now we can represent both of these schematically uh, so curly P is a, essentially a function from the product J times M into positive real numbers. In this case, it could be, it could be natural numbers if you like, uh, but we'll treat the more general case today. And then a schedule is defined by now two functions from J cross M into R plus. Uh, S is the start time and T, T is the stop time. 
but for the scheduling for the schedule we ha we have some additional axioms so for the for the problem p we're allowed to assign whatever positive positive real numbers we want but for the schedule there are some restrictions so the first and most obvious restriction is that the start time needs to precede the stop time clearly uh, some slightly less obvious uh, restrictions are that if we have a job, we can't, let, let me say if I can say this properly, no job can be worked on, we can't work on a single job on two machines at the same time. And we can't use a single machine to work on two jobs at the same time. So there are two no overlap conditions that can be represented as disjunctions. And so in order to define this, uh, the scheduling category S, we need to have the data S and T, and we also need to know that, that those maps satisfy some assumptions. And moreover, these two schemas are related by a function, uh, which I'm called by a functor, I should say, called F, that maps the arrow tau in P to the difference of T and S in script S. Okay, so on to slide eight. Uh, so functorial semantics and duality. The idea is that this functor that maps from P to S encodes a fact. And the fact that it encodes is that every schedule solves some problem. And so the way that this works is first of all, we, well, I didn't do this. Uh, category theorists have, have observed that whenever we have an instance a, a concrete schedule, we can think of this as a functor. And so a functor means that it maps objects to objects and arrows to arrows in a way that preserves composition. Now, in this, in this script P, there actually is no non-trivial composition. So that we're really just talking about a graph homomorphism in sets. And so nodes, to ma nodes map to sets. So uh, P of J is gonna be this actual set of J1, J2, J3, J4 and edges are gonna to map to functions. So uh, P of tau is the function that sends J2 and lathe to three hours, along with many other specific values that were listed on the table on the previous page. Uh, so now what duality says is that anytime we have a functor between schemas, this induces a transformation in the opposite direction on instances. So if I have an instance of curly S, that means that I have some interpretation of little s and I have some interpretation of little t. And given both of those pieces of information, I can now get an interpretation of the problem category by just taking the difference. That's exactly what, the, what f on the previous page said. It said we map tau to t minus s. And so if I have an, an interpretation for s and an interpretation of t, I take the difference and I get an interpretation for tau. And so from a categorical perspective, that means that duality is really just precomposition. So the, the last figure on slide eight shows on the left-hand side, we have an instance of curly S, that's an actual schedule. And on the right, we have an instance of curly P, that's an actual problem. And the way that we got that, that instance of curly P was by just composing the instance of S with the functor F. And that gives us a new functor to, to sets which is an instance on curly P. Okay, uh, next slide, slide nine. Okay, so that's a quick, but I hope fairly intuitive and simple example. And what I wanna do now is I wanna look at why graphs are not good enough to express those relationships. And uh, I, in this, I've identified four things that we needed to do that graphs don't really have a good handle on. So the first thing is we need to have structured nodes and edges. So when we wanted to talk about the edge tau, the source of that edge was J times M. We need to have both the job and the machine before we can get the, the processing time. And in graphs, there is not a, at least not a canonical way of structuring nodes in order to make these sorts of definitions. And as I'll show in just a minute, the, the reason from my perspective that graphs don't have this is because you absolutely need composition in order to be able to express it. 
the second thing that we needed was some built-in elements, uh, what I'll refer to as libraries. So when we, when we defined the functor into the category S, we didn't just use the, the elements S and T that were part of that schema. We also used the fact that the target was a real number and that we can take differences of real numbers. So we need some way of expressing the fact that some nodes in our graph stand for what I think of as computational entities. And moreover, we need to be able to express the computations that, that can be used to connect these different computational entities. Uh, the third thing that we needed was uh, we really need to embed some of the axioms and some of the proofs into our, just, into our definition of this mapping. So if we, if we know that S is positive and we know that T is positive, that alone is not enough to know that T minus S is positive because it could be that S minus T is, it could be that T minus S is negative. And so in order to actually know that we really got a, a legitimate instance on curly P, we really needed to use the axioms that were present in S as well as combining those with some, in this case, very simple elements of proof that show that, uh, that, show that this works. And so then the final reason, and to me, this is really the most important one and the sort of the most knockdown reason that graphs aren't good enough, is that the mapping is not a graph homomorphism. We take, because it takes a single edge tau and it maps that to a, a path of edges in the, target, in the target category or the target graph. And so what this, so the, and the reason that I think this is really a more important reason than the others is that the first three elements could be handled by the by implementation whoever's building the graph that we're using could put could themselves put in things to play these roles but the the homomorphism is something that's defined after the fact and so we really need to provide the person who's constructing that relationship with some tools for building the relationship even if those tools are not have not been implemented in the graph to begin with. And uh, so I'm gonna now go through each of these one by one in more detail. So the next slide is slide 10. So structure in a category. Uh, this is the bog standard ver uh, definition of a product in a category. If any of you are, have, have uh, ever delved into this, you've run into it before. And often this sort of a definition is where people's brains start to turn off. So the Cartesian product of two objects, X and Y, is a diagram. It's an object P together with two maps, one to X and one to Y, such that for any object Z and any pair of arrows X from Z to X and Y from Z to Y, there exists a unique map P that we call the pair XY, such that P dot P pi one is X and P dot pi two is Y. Uh, incidentally, I should have mentioned before that I'm gonna be using uh, period or dot as my composition operator, and I will do it in diagrammatic order, which means that P comes before pi one, rather than the sort of more traditional mathematical order uh, where things are reversed. But all in all, the, the textual definition is usually not as easy to understand as the diagrammatic one. And so uh, at the bottom of this slide, I've given the standard diagram that expresses this, uh, this relationship. So this says that the stuff at the bottom, the stuff across the bottom is a product if for anything that's preceded with a, with a universal quantifier, there is a thing, and in fact a unique thing that is pre preceded by the existential quantifier that makes this diagram commute. And that just means that uh, when I compose the pads of edges, I get the same answer. Uh, okay, but if we go on to slide 11, there's actually a much, to me, much more intuitive expression of what this product is. And to demonstrate it, we introduce a suggestive notation. So rather than writing the, map, the maps out of Z as an arrow, I'm instead gonna write them as an element. But because we need to keep track of the domain, I'm going to write Z underneath the element symbol. And so now we can compare the definition of a product in set theory with the defini definition of a product in category theory. And this is on the left, it's not really the definition of a product in set theory because I haven't given you the von Neumann definition of a product 
of a pair in terms of sets of sets of sets. But uh, if, you, if you're interested, ask me later or, or go look it up in a set theory textbook. The, the key point is that in set theory, an element of the product x times y is equivalent to an element of x, an element of y, and the assertion that p is the pair x, y, where the pair x, y is some sort of complicated definition that von Neumann came up with. Now, in category theory, we can take the definition that I gave you on the previous page, and it says that p is a z element of x cross y, just in case x is a z element of x cross y, y is a z element of, I'm sorry, x is a z element of x, y is a z element of big Y, and P is equal to the pair X comma Y, where what I mean by P equals the pair is instead of the von Neumann definition, it's interpreted in terms of these uh, projections. So an arrow is a pair of X and Y just in case it projects out to X and it projects out to Y. And so the obvious question is sort of, well, why, why did we introduce this C? What was, what's the point of having these generalized elements. Why generalize? And so the reason that we need to do this is because in sets, arrows out of a one element set can see everything. And I haven't been precise about what that means, but I can, I can, I can go into it in more detail if people have questions later. But the key point really is that in other categories, that one element set does not see everything. So in particular, in graph, uh, so now, the one element set is really a, a graph with one node and no edges. And the point is that it can't distinguish between a graph that has two nodes and no edges and a graph that has two nodes and has one hedge. And so just looking at these two graphs from the perspective of a single node is not enough to see what's going on. If we look at it with both a single node and a, and a single edge, between the two of those, we can see everything in graphs in the same way that a single element sees everything in sets. In the category of vector spaces, it's even worse. This, the, analogous, the analogous element of a one element set is the zero dimensional vector space. And that can't see anything at all because there is exactly one homomorphism from a zero dimensional vector space into any other vector space. And so this is what's called the zero object. And there are many other examples like this, but the key point is that uh, in both what I think of as geometric categories like graphs and algebraic categories like VECT, there are structures that can't be witnessed by a single element, but they can be witnessed by more complicated structures. So for example, in the category of vector spaces, the one dimensional vector space can see everything in the same sense that a one element set can. Okay, uh, on to slide 12. Okay, so a little bit more structure. Uh, actually, I should have mentioned. Here in the previous slide, I gave you the definition of the uh, Cartesian product, but there are many, many other types of structures and all of them follow a somewhat similar pattern. And Many, but not all of them can be interpreted in this way in terms of generalized elements, in which case there is a fairly, fairly canonical uh, crank that one can turn to transform the set theoretic definitions into category theoretic definitions. Okay, so now on slide 12, there's a little bit more structure that I need to talk about in order to uh, introduce this notion of libraries and types. So in programming, a function is called pure if it has, first of all, it has no side effects. So it can't have any input output. It can't write to a database or read from a database. It can't talk to a user. And it also uh, can't change any non-local variables. So if you're familiar with programming in Python, often you'll throw a couple of global variables at the top of your script. And if you have, if your code changes those, you may have experienced that uh, modifying those global variables can lead to very, uh, a lot of complication in analyzing your code because you often don't know what the current value of that global variable is, and you may not know what is doing the changes. Uh, similarly, a pure function also has to have consistent return values. So that means, for example, that it cannot make use of probabilistic analysis. So it always has to give the same output for the same input. And so again, we can't have any 
dependence on no non-local variables because those could change and then the values of our functions would change. But the, the upside is when it, we restrict ourselves to only the pure functions, we can build a category out of a programming language, which I'll call type. And really the key, the key structural element that inhabits this type category is what's called an exponential uh, or a function space. And so again, this, is, this ends up being the same sort of a, of a relationship that we saw previously between ca uh, categories and graphs. So what's called an adjunction. And so in this case, uh, the exponential adjunction mediates the relationship between global elements that, involve, that depend on just a single element and generalized elements whose domains might be more complicated, might be more complicated nodes. Uh, so in this case, uh, the functor going up, the, the analogous, uh, the, struct, the mapping which is analogous to free, takes a type and it adds a factor of z to it. So we take the product with z. And the, the functor that, which is analogous to forget takes the exponential. So it builds the set of functions from z into something. And so the, the adjunction, then says that if I have a function from x cross z into y, I can do what's called currying and transform that into a function that depends just on x, but returns another function that depends on z. So that's the middle line. And of course, I can curry more than once. So I can turn a multivariable function x f from x cross z into y into a single element which is a function that takes an x and returns a function that takes a z and returns a y. So those sound like they might be the same thing, and that's why we have this relationship uh, between them. And so in this case, again, we have the, the two round trips. So eval says, if I have a type y and I build the functions on that type, and, that, and then I take the product with an element of z, then I can transform that pair into a single element by just evaluating. So if I have a function from z to y and I have an element of z, I can apply it to get an element of y. On the other hand, the coeval co says, if I have an x, then I can build you a new function that takes a z and returns a pair. And so these guys are the, the analogs of the concat and compute that we saw a few slides back. Uh, next slide, slide 13. So the, the upshot of this is that we can build types into our schemas. Uh, and as I mentioned before, we can think of these as being libraries. So the way that this works is we first of all isolate a subschema inside the main schema. So inside of curly P, we identify a smaller graph, which I'll call P0. And moreover, we also demand that we have a fixed implementation functor that turns the elements of P0 into types and functions in the category of types. So that says, for any of the nodes and edges in P, which are designated as types, I have associated with that node an actual type in the programming language, and, with the, and I have associated with that edge an actual function in the programming language. And together with this implementation, we also have a demand that the instances, the data on top of curly P, should respect that. So P assigns a set to, every, to all of the nodes and all of the edges, and the sets that are assigned to the types should be consistent with the implementation. So there is always a functor that goes from the type category into the set category, and it's built by forming all of what are called the global elements, or the maps from the one element set or the unit type into an arbitrary type. And so if I have a type X, I can build a set by looking at all of the closed terms in X. That's another, another standard terminology coming more from logic. And so the idea is if I start down in the lower left corner in P0 and I have a type that's implemented, and then I look at the global elements of that, then those should be exactly the, that should be the, exactly the set that is assigned to that type in the instance uh, that goes from curly P to set. And so that's just saying that whenever I have a value whose 
if whenever I have a value inside a inside an object whose which is designated as a type, that value is actually one of the values that it that lives in the programming language. Okay, so now we've got the first two elements uh, uh, that I discussed before. So we have structured elements inside our schemas. We have types and libraries inside our schemas. The next problem is that we need tau to be a positive real number, but in general, as I mentioned before, knowing that S and T are positive is not enough to guarantee that. So on the next slide, slide 14, I'm gonna say a little bit about how logic works inside a schema. So in general, a formula is going to define a sub-object. So a sub-object is what's called a monic arrow, or more particularly an equivalence class of monic arrows. Uh, but you can, if you're more comfortable thinking about sets, then just think about this as being an injective function. So essentially, as a category theorist, I would prefer to work with injective functions rather than subsets, because subset, because first of all, if I have an injective function, I can get a subset by taking the image. If I have a subset, I can get an injective function by taking the inclusion. And so there, the two concepts are essentially equivalent, but in order to talk about subsets, I need element hood, whereas to talk about injective functions, I can just talk, I can express that purely in terms of composition. And so uh, the funny arrows that have a little tail on them, that indicates a subobject or an injective function. And so anytime I have a formula, phi of x, that's going to be a subobject. And anytime I have an inference between subobjects, that's going to be a sub subobject. So that means that if phi is a subobject of x and psi is a subobject of x and phi entails psi, then phi is also a subobject of, of psi. And so now the interpretations of a formula are going to be defined recursively in essentially the same way that they are in traditional model theory. So for instance, if I want to interpret an equation between two variables, well, first of all, those variables have to be the same type x, and the subobject that corresponds to that is, in fact, constructed using the product structure. It's just the pair of an identity and an identity. Right? If I have an element x, and I look at its image under a pair of identities, then I will get all of the possible true values of equality. So uh, in essence, what we're, the, the object that we construct, you should think of that as all of the values inside of X which satisfy the formula, uh, also called the extension of the formula. In order to define the conjunction of two formulas, we form what's called a pullback. So I'm not gonna go into the, into the definition of what this is, but uh, in sets, if we are looking at subobjects, this is an intersection. And so it really does generalize the standard definition in terms of uh, set theory. If we want to build the disjunction, we can do it similar with a similar but dual construction that's called the, pull, uh, the push out, but we have to be a little bit careful. Uh, in, in category theory, because we don't have element hood, there is, there is not an intuitive, there's not an inherent notion of overlap between things. Uh, However, because we assume that phi and psi have the same variables, they're subobjects of the same, the same x, and so we can first form the pullback to get the intersection, and then we form the pushout over, the, over that given intersection. The, the, basically, the idea is without element hood, we have to explicitly specify what the overlap between two things is, but because we know that the variables are the same, we have the means of doing that. And then uh, finally, I'm gonna give the existential quantifier, uh, which can be built in terms of an image, uh, which is essentially the same thing that we do in, in set theory. So if I have some formula phi that's a subobject sub of x cross y, then I can project out to x, and I can take the image of the subset under that projection, and that will give me the interpretation of the existentially quantified formula. Now, of course, I've left out a whole lot of logic and you're probably wondering where's not, where's implies, where's for all. And I've left those out because in category theory, we actually need some additional structure to do that. Uh, the reason that this is not so obvious classically is that if we have classical negation, then we get the rest for free. But uh, logic in category theory 
prefers to be intuitionistic. And so the, what I presented here is actually very close to uh, description logic, which is obviously going to be relevant for, uh, for OWL and other ontological analysis. It may look like it's not because I don't have an implication, but uh, there are ways, uh, basically, in, because we can handle sequence, we can get one layer of implication and one layer of existential quantica quantification essentially for free. Uh, so there's a, there's a fair amount of detail that goes into justifying that, but uh, I just want you to know that even though I haven't given you those interpretations as formulas, we can still interpret them uh, in a meaningful way. Okay, uh, next slide is slide 15. So here the idea is that once we've recognized that formulas are subobjects, then inferences and proofs can be viewed as objects. And more, well, yeah, okay, so first of all, I've given you an axiom. So inside the schema curly S, we would like to demand that the start time precedes the stop time. That's the, that's the example that I'm gonna run through. And so we can view that in the category as being this commutative triangle that says, if I look at the values of S and T, then that factors through the interpretation of the ordering. Uh, where fa by factor through, I mean there exists this arrow curly L that makes the triangle commute. And so this is really just a reformul reform reformulation of what it would mean uh, in set theory as well, right? If I know that S is always less than T, then I know that I can build this lift L from, from this, the elements that I have. Uh, similarly, uh, on the next line, we have an inference. So we know that if X is less than or equal to Y in the product, and we take the difference of those two things, then the result will be positive. And we can represent that as a commutative square that says, basically, along the bottom, I'm taking any two arbitrary numbers and taking their difference. That gives me a, an arbitrary real number. But now, if I restrict that function to the subclass where X is less than Y, then I know that the result ends up in R plus. And so in particular, we can, the cut rule, which allows us to compose proofs, can be viewed as concatenation of diagrams. So the right-hand side of the axiom that I've given is the same as the left-hand side of the inference. And so we can really just chain them together in order to give a proof that F of tau, S minus T, uh, T minus S, really is a positive number. And so, by building the by building the subobjects and axioms and inferences into our schemas, we can justify some of the operations that we that we make. Okay, uh, on to slide 16. And as I mentioned, to me, this is really the the main reason that categories or the the main thing that categories bring to, over and above graphs is the ability to express more flexible relationships between them. So, and that's the key point, is that even if we have two categories which came from graphs, they're the graphs we got for free, or the categories we got for free, then the functors between those categories are more general than the graph homomorphisms between the graphs we started with. Because in general, nodes map to, to nodes, but edges can map to paths of edges rather than single edges. So in particular, in this case, we have the single edge tau that's being mapped to the path L dot P, where L and P are elements of the, ac of the axioms and the inferences that I mentioned on the previous slide. Uh, I should mention that usually we're interested in structure preserving functors, both in terms of maps between schemas and maps between instances. So I didn't say this before, but uh, in, when we talk about instances, we're always going to assume that the image of J cross M is the image of J crossed with the image of M. And similarly for any other struct, for any other operations that we might've done, including the subobjects and the pullbacks and the pushouts that we talked about before. Uh, additionally, we also want to assume that the types are preserved so that I know that the implementation of a type in curly P agrees with the implementation of a, of a type in curly S. Uh, 
at the end, I'll say a little bit more about how we can weaken both of these assumptions in order to give even more flexibility into the, the notion of uh, homomorphisms between schemas. Um, one thing that I'll say before I go on to the next slide is that uh, this, flex this added flexibility that functors give on top of graph homomorphisms can be very useful when we are mapping between different levels of abstraction. So very often, if I have a graph that represents some sort of high level of abstraction and another graph that represents a low level of abstraction, then a single edge in the high level may be interpreted as a sequence of edges in the low level. And a functor allows us to express that relationship to interpret the high level in the low level, whereas a graph homomorphism does not. Okay, uh, so that's, that wraps up sort of section two explaining what, what for me is missing in, in traditional graphs. And so now I'm gonna go on and do some, a little bit more theory, and then I'll give a, several examples that show what, this look, show what this looks like in practice. Okay, so the next thing that I wanna point out is, so previously we looked at just a single functor that was going from curly P into curly S, and I told you that that uh, represented the fact that every solution, every schedule, solve some problem. Now I'd like to go in the other direction and look at how we can extract solutions from problems. So in particular, anytime we have a solution algorithm little a, we can think of this as defining a matrix endomorphism. So a map from a matrix to it, uh, a matrix, a map from a space of matrices to itself. So uh, using the currying operation that I talked about before, we can take tau and instead of thinking about it as 16 individual values, we can wrap it up into a collection of 16 values. So this R plus to the J cross M is a function space and it is the it's the space of all functions that map from J cross M into R plus. And so that really is sort of all by itself represents the problem. And now A is the map that's going to take tau JM and transform it into the matrix of start times. Of course, once we have the start times, it's easy to get the stop times by just adding on tau. And so what this allows us to do is to find a functor that goes in the opposite direction. Instead of going from P into S, capital A goes from S into P. And the way that it works is it sends S to the evaluation of A of the name of tau on J and M. That's a handful, that's a mouthful, I'll say it more in just a second. And it sends T to wherever we sent S plus tau. And so that complicated guy that I just met, that I just spoke a minute ago, A of S, the sequence of maps is, is described in this chain just below. So we start from J cross M, and the first thing we do is we add on the wrapped up version of tau. So this is, in logic, this is traditionally called the name of tau. And then we apply A to that name in order to get the name of A, uh, I'm sorry, we apply little a to the name of tau in order to get a solution, which is gonna be the name of s, and then we evaluate it on the elements, of the, J, the elements j and m that we started with. And so if you look at the definition above, that really is just a transcription of this sequence of arrows in the, in the schema curly p. Okay, now I should note that to do this properly would really require us to do some additional proof. In particular, we would need to show that little a satisfies the axioms of M. So it's easy, it's of course very easy to, to show that T is greater than S because that's uh, right here in the addition. But in order to, to verify that we had the no overlap axioms that I mentioned before, we would have to do a lot more work. Uh, and this is, maybe not easy work, but this is tied up with, uh, this is tied up with some usage of category theory and more generally type theory in formal verification. Uh, the idea is that uh, in practice, the most robust forms of uh, formal, ver formal verification tend to be based on, uh, based on uh, something called dependent type theory. Uh, so these are 
these are some systems called Koch and Agda, and uh, dependent type theory is very closely related to category theory in the sense that category theory tends to give the semantics for these uh, syntactic theories, and so there are some means, at least uh, not too far away, for actually doing these sorts of uh, verifications. And one other thing that I wanted to note is that, so I hand waved an equivalence between this function space and the space of matrices. Uh, but in order to actually do that, we need to have a labeling over the elements of J and the elements of M. And this actually adds some non-trivial structure into our schema, which is not obvious, uh, but it does. Uh, I, at the end, I'll mention that, that all of the talk that I'm giving today is based on a paper and the details of this equivalence uh, or the details of a similar equivalence are given in the paper. So if you're, if you're curious, you can ask at the end or uh, get the paper from me and that's a, a good place to look at. Well, actually, uh, we're key... getting close to the end of the hour. Oh, goodness. And uh, okay, we let's... would like to have a, uh, a few questions. Uh, um, Robbie yeah, has sorry, yeah. Uh, how much more do let you have, me, Spencer? Let, let me do one more slide, and then I'll leave the last few slides for you guys to look at on your own, because I think they should be fairly self-explanatory. Okay. Okay, so the, last, I the last slide that I'll talk about is 18. Uh, so I've said a knowledge graph in quotation marks. And so the, uh, by duality, we know that every problem P in the instances of P defines a, a solution A star of P in the instances of S. And so using this functor A, we can actually pull back to solve the problem from the problem instance. Uh, and the reason that I put this graph in quotation marks is that already here, we would like to be able to introduce a path equation. Uh, because if we go up by F and then down by A, we should get back to where we started with. That's an assertion that the algorithm solved the problem that it was given. And so, I guess what I'm saying is that here, we've given a very tiny knowledge graph that really has something meaningful underneath because each of the nodes is interpreted as a categorical schema, each of the edges is interpreted as a functor. And so we really have, this is what, this is maybe one answer that category theory could give about what's underneath a knowledge graph. So I guess I'll stop there and I'll just say that the next four slides give four variations on this open shop scheduling problem and look at how it change, how the, how the, how the situation would change as we vary the problem, as well as the relationships between the original problem and the, and the modified version. All right, end. Can you hear me? Yes. Oh, okay. So I'm in, uh... I, we don't know where to begin because some of the definitions are difficult for us in this quick, for example, the meaning or implication of the uh, symbol tau. When in the last slide you are saying you go from A to tau, is the tau a type or is uh, it an enumeration of elements of a graph? Is on, on, on slide 18? La last slide that you showed. Slide 18. Okay. They're they're labeled the number. The slide numbers are at the bottom right. Yes. Uh, uh, right. Okay. I mean, okay. So we're on slide 18. Tau, 18. Yeah. So, so tau refers to an arrow in the category curly p. Is what again? <laughs> it is an arrow or an edge in the in the schema curly p. So curly P is a category or a schema that yes. generates a category. And tau is one arrow inside that category. I see. Okay. But, Thank you. But, it, but curly P is such a simple category that that's really the only non-trivial structure in there. But by capital R, you implied libraries at one stage. Uh, capital, yeah, yeah, so the blackboard bold R. So R, R zero means what in the library sense? The zeroth uh, order or what? Uh, you mean R plus? R, I don't think there is. Uh, superscript zero. 
uh, oh, that's p, super, uh, p subscript zero. So that represents the nodes and edges in the schema, which are assumed to be implemented as types in some programming language. Actually, on but slide 11, talking of R in 15. Is this the one you're talking slide, about? Slide, slide 15, 15 or 11? wherever else you define capital R. Ah, so that guy, yeah, so that's going to be a type inside the sub schema curly P0. So, so R and R plus cross R plus are both going to be objects in the category curly S in this case. So what would be R0 then? There is no R0. There's a P0. R, 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 R to the superscript zero. Uh, oh, you must. So it should be That's, R super, superscript plus. Uh, no, so there maybe, is, maybe there's some sort occur, of encoding problem. There is this on slide okay. 11. Do you see on this? On slide 11. Uh, slide 11 doesn't have any R's at all. Yes, it does. Uh, oh, 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 I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Uh, uh, I'm sorry. Now I see. Uh, that is the zero dimensional vector space on R. That so, means it is a scalar. Uh, it is so same not, as scalar. Uh, uh, no. So zero dimensional vector is a scalar. A scalar in. It's it's not a. So I would usually distinguish between a, a space of scalars, which is going to be field, and it, so it, this a, a vector space and a and this and the field of scalars are not exactly the same. Uh, the, okay. So a zero dimensional vector space has only an origin and no other elements inside. Okay. All right. Uh, the the advantage of uh, um, set theory versus uh, category theory. What would be your one sentence answer or two sentence answer? Uh, let's see. I why why not okay, set two, theory two, itself two, two, for knowledge right. graph? Right. So so two two sentences. First of all, they're not in conflict. Uh, category theory is happy to use set theory, and in fact, uh, maybe I should have slipped, gone to the last slide. So one of the, this is no longer a two-sentence answer, uh, so one of the main pieces of category theory that we're interested in using is uh, using this uh, idea of functorial semantics in order to construct new semantic spaces. So earlier we defined what a graph was in terms of a pair of sets and a pair of functions, and we can actually view this as being a categorical definition of a new type of semantics that's built out of sets. So we can build graphs from sets. And this is a, a very general uh, procedure that uh, uses structures called pre-sheaves and sheaves in order to interpret logical theories, uh, models of logical theories as uh, set-valued functors. Now, the other thing that I would say about why category theory and not set theory is that we can also talk about semantics that are not sets. So we can talk about functors to categories of vector spaces or functors to categories of types and computations that don't really have an obvious meaning in set theory. I, I guess I have taken a lot of space, time space uh, in terms of my questions. If others don't have, I will ask more. One or two more. Let's see. Uh, or says? a quick one. I mean, you are precluding probabilities. So what would you do about probabilistic functions? So there, are, there actually are means of making more sophisticated categories of types. Uh, there's several different approaches. So one, one approach uses the structures called monads that I introduced earlier. Uh, to build what's called a Clisley category that allows for probabilistic mappings. Uh, one can also introduce uh, state objects and uh, introduce operations on state that allow you to uh, essentially mimic what's going on in the, in the computer's probabilistic uh, algorithms. Uh, 
So there, there are approaches to adding in this additional certification. I just didn't want to go into them because they're more complicated. Very good, very good. Thank you. Thank you so much. So, uh, Janet, did you have a question? Uh, yes. Um, so I think, um, yeah, there's a lot of terminology and notation, as you know, and it's, it's hard to uh, relate um, these ideas to other questions one might have about, um, I, you know, use cases and things like that as one is trying to digest everything you're doing. So I, I'm intending to go back through and I'm, I'm glad to have this in one place and I would, I would like to see the paper too. Um, I'm going to listen to the tape again and go slowly. Um, but uh, a question that came up in the chat is, um, so it's good to know that this is available in the foundations um, for people who are, um, you know, working on that level, let's say, uh, just loosely. But to what extent is it relevant and accessible to others at, in different areas? And I know you, you work on this a lot. Um, you know, how can it be made more accessible and who should it be accessible to? That's really an excellent question. Uh, so if, if, you, if you look forward to the last slide, one of the things I pointed out as, as the bad news is the limited tooling and the steep learning curve. And so uh, I think at present, uh, categorical ideas are most useful in the design stage. Uh, because they provide a collection of design patterns which are known to work well in certain ways. And, uh, and so what that, and, and not only are known to work well in certain ways, but are non-obvious. And so there's sort of a, uh, a in, in, in category theory, we tend to try and solve the whole problem up front so that any time we face a specific instance of it, we can use the same solution. And what that means is that the learning curve is very steep because at, at the very beginning, you have to solve the whole thing. But what it means that is that as you add more and more, uh, more and more examples or more and more instances of a problem, it gets easier and easier to do because you can rely on the same infrastructure at, uh, all the time. And so right now, you can use those design patterns that category theorists have come up with and use them to implement structures in more robust tooling in a way that, because we know the mathematical structure works, we know that those, that those implementations will work as well. This tends to be the way that things go in something like functional programming, where uh, people take ideas from category theory and then implement them in a programming language. Even if under the hood, it doesn't agree with what's going on in the, in the mathematics, as long as there's some sort of abstraction interface that makes sure that a user doesn't have access to, to breaking those things, you can still have confidence that things will work as they're supposed to. Uh, now, the steep learning curve means that, I, that in my opinion at least, uh, the best way forward for doing this is basically having a an intermediate class of people that provides an interface between the people who are trying to solve problems and the people who are building tools. And this sort of intermediate layer is the only one that really needs to know the category theory because they need to implement it on the, on the tool side and they need to provide the interfaces for the user side. But I think if we can set up a sort of community structures along those lines, then we can limit the necessary knowledge and baggage in the overall community while still getting the benefits of the approach. Yes, um, good, thanks. Um, and so I guess also, what if, can you describe some um, uh, cases of applied category theory? Um, where there have been, I know functional programming is, is one whole uh, world uh, where it is used. Um, and so in OR, for example, um, have there been significant successes 
um, that should give us hope? Uh, not, not in anything is applied as OR. Uh, the, the, main, the main real successes of category theory are, first of all, functional programming, and then quantum mechanics, and in particular, quantum computing, uh, because there are some, some structures called monoidal categories that are very good for interpolating between uh, classical computation and physical processes. Uh, there has also been some fairly successful work in uh, some areas of data processing. Uh, I, there, there was a recent uh, thread that went around on a, on a categories mailing list about a, let me see if I can find it, uh, a data analysis algorithm called UMAP that was initially developed uh, using categorical ideas, although it's not entirely clear whether the, the category theory is absolutely necessary to realize the benefits. And this is actually something that I think comes up quite a lot. Uh, there's a famous story about uh, John Helmos, who's a famous mathematician, who uh, after reading a new result that someone had published with, from using category theory, went down and wrote, wrote a proof that you used no category theory. And this tends to be fairly typical in the sense that there, there's a sense in which category theory has very little content. It's all about form. And so it's never going to solve a problem for you, but it may make it easier to break a problem down into pieces. And so uh, from my perspective, it's more about helping humans manage complexity than it is about outright solving problems. Although not, all, not everyone would agree with me about that. Oh, one point I wanted to make uh, is about the uh, uh, OM OMG standard. It's uh, called the Distributed Ontology Modeling and Specification Language. And they mm -hmm. used category theory in order to relate uh, the, a wide range of different logics that are used in the semantic web and common logic and uh, others. So that they use category theory under the covers in order to show what mappings are possible between RDF and OWL and uh, first order logic and common logic and many other logics that are being used. And the uh, uh, DOL is the name of the standard and it's by the object management group. But um, the results that they use are stated in terms of logics that people use uh, for ontology and for computation. And the under the covers, of uh, category theory, in fact, the institution theory, which is an application of category theory, is what they actually use for mapping logics to logics. Mm -hmm. yeah, and I'm a little bit familiar with it. And it's also important that they have the software. It's called the Heterogeneous Toolkit or Toolset HETS. And this is free and open source software that can be used to map uh, uh, anything stated in one of these logics to another logic. and so on along the arrows that are uh, supported by the uh, uh, that are determined by using the institution theory. Mm -hmm. yeah, I, so I put, that, go ahead. Yeah, I, I put a reference to that in the uh, chat. Yeah, so this is something that I didn't get into at all. That that work, from my perspective, is actually going on at one meta level above what I've been talking about. So. Uh, and this is actually another advantage of category theory is that it can operate at both the sort of the object level and the meta level, right? So what you're talking about is mapping between different kinds of logics. And so for me, those would be something like two categories. So categories of categories. Uh, but here, what I've been talking about is really using category theory as a language for doing modeling, which is, I think is really something else. Okay, it sounds like um, we have come to the uh, good point to adjourn. Um, so I will thank you very much. I'm going to uh, stop the